I'm Dalton Roberts, and I'm the pastor of Parkway Baptist Church in Trinity, Alabama. And I'm here in Webster, New York at the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church, and we're having a wonderful time with Pastor Jack Young. And we are having a biblical preaching workshop. We have uh, hosted numerous biblical preaching workshops, had a couple at our church in Alabama, and we've had one up in two, I think, up in Maine. And so it's a new thing that we're doing, and I'm very excited about it. It is our goal to encourage preachers not only to determine to preach the Word of God, to preach sermons that are shaped by the Scripture, where the Scripture is the sermon, but it is our goal to, to, to do some teaching and to provide some information, some extended education in the subject, in the area of biblical preaching, trying to be an encouragement to preachers, pastors, missionaries in the area of the most important work that we do, and that is preaching the Bible. I mean, we're having a great time here. We have James Knox from DeLand, Florida. There's not a better preacher anywhere than Brother Knox, and man, he has really fed us and encouraged us in the Word of God. And so I hope you'll enjoy these videos, and they will give you an indication of what we're trying to do. We, we don't have all the answers. We are just trying to share some good information. And we do believe, it is our conviction, that if preaching is not biblical, I don't mean using the Bible, but if it is not shaped by the Scripture, if the Word of God in its context is not the point of the preaching, it's not biblical preaching. And we hope that this will be an encouragement to you, and maybe you can look up one of our uh, workshops in the future and attend, and we hope it would be a blessing to you. Nehemiah and chapter number 8, and we'll see this thing that we're talking about today and tomorrow laid out for us beautifully in God's Word. Nehemiah chapter 8, in verse number 1, all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And verse 2, Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from morning until midday. So they started at 9, went to noon. How about that? Before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the law of God. Wouldn't that be a blessing? And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. So you have a man in a pulpit reading God's word to a, to a congregation of people, an assembly of people. Now look at verse number 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Our, our job, brother, is to first of all tell people what the Bible says. Read it to them. They're not reading it. It's up to you to read it to them. You can have your Bible reading charts. You can have your Bible reading challenges. You can preach once a month on read your Bible. People aren't reading their Bibles. Okay? You're getting paid to read it for them. Okay? They're getting paid to fix your air conditioner. They're getting paid to fix your car. You're getting paid to read the Bible for them. Okay? And then to give the sense. I don't mean this to be mean-spirited. I don't mean this critically. There are a thousand things in this world I do not understand because I've never been trained. I've never spent sufficient time to be able to understand them. The people coming to our churches do not understand the Bible. They have never been taught the Bible. If they're from a religious background, most of what they've been taught, they have to unlearn. If they're from a totally secular background, like most people we get to into the Lord nowadays, they don't know anything about the Bible. We have a former, a, a college in our town that was a Southern Baptist University. My pastor, when I got saved, went to seminary at that college, and he was a, he was a Bible expositor. We talked to students from that school, college students. They have never laid eyes on a Bible. They do not know the story of Jonah, of, 
of Noah. They've heard some things about it. They, they know nothing about the Bible. So we have to give the sense. And then it's our responsibility, as the Scripture says here, to cause them to understand the reading. So I must understand the Bible. It must make sense to me. I must know its words. I must know its phrases. I must know its, its cross-references. I must know uh, its doctrines. And I must be able to convey that knowledge to the people who have come to church. That's, that's, that's my responsibility. That's what I owe them. I, I don't want to take a college course from a professor who doesn't know his subject. And I don't want to take a college course from a professor who assumes that I know his subject. <laughs> I'm not insulted if he takes it all the way down to its most fundamental, elemental, right. basic truths because I want him to teach me what he knows. And if we're polite about it and if we're, if we're not condescending, People don't mind us speaking to them as though they know nothing and understand nothing. Don't, don't call them know-nothings. Don't call them dummies. They're not dummies. I don't know anything. I don't, honestly, my, it just, it's just how I was raised. You were raised different me. I don't know the first thing about repairing an automobile engine. I don't. And for a guy to, t to insult me and say, what, are you stupid? What, are you some kind of a sissy? You don't know how to fix your car engine? That doesn't fix my car. I know I don't know how to fix the car. I want you to fix it. And if it's okay, you can tell me what's wrong and why it's wrong and what I should have done to keep it from going wrong. I'm okay with that. And I will pay you to fix it. I'm coming to you because I expect you to know how to fix my car because that's what you've done for a living for two decades. When people really put forth the effort in this day and age, put forth the effort to come to church, they're expecting you to give them something they don't have, to teach them something they, they don't know, to show them how to do something better than their parents showed them how to do it or their worldly friends growing up showed them how to do it. So, so we have this, this great Bible here. And if we told them to read it, didn't, didn't you read it some of you before you got saved? Didn't you read it after you got saved? Aren't there still passages in it you look at? So we're not teaching that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, there's passages in the Bible. I used to know what they meant. I don't anymore. <laughs> I was sure I had that one figured out. And now, now we just leave it alone. But, but Nehemiah didn't, listen, Nehemiah the priest didn't expect farmers to have mastered the scriptures. He didn't expect carpenters to have mastered the scriptures. He didn't expect housewives to have mastered the scriptures. They expected him to have mastered the scriptures. And so they are, they are depending upon him. You, you, want your, <laughs> you want your dentist to know more about teeth than you do, Amen. Right? The preacher's supposed to know more about the Bible than the people coming to church, but he's also supposed to be able to impart that. You know, one of the, one of the qualifications for spiritual leadership in the church in 1 Timothy is apt to teach. That doesn't mean wants to. It means has an aptitude, an ability to teach the Bible. And so that's, that's what we want to have, what we want to develop. Now, watch, real, real interesting. Verse number nine, and Nehemiah, which is the... Tershatha and Ezra, the priest, the, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Uh, then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, you've heard that phrase a thousand times. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That verse is what came into the lives of these people after having the scriptures explained to them. Yeah. Amen. An understanding of the word of God brought joy to their hearts and strengthened them. 
It took them from weeping to joy. It took them from, from hunger to, to eating the fat and the sweet. Yes. It's, it's, it's a happy time. Uh, in verse number 11, so the Levites uh, stilled all the people saying, hold your peace for today, the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth. Look, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Here's what happens, brother. We get together in meetings like this and we talk about how messed up the government is. And we talk about how messed up the schools are. And we talk about how corrupt and perverted Hollywood is. And then we knock on doors and we, we come back and talk about how people didn't want to hear the word of God. And how, how it used to be so much better door knocking 40 years ago. And, and then we get up in the pulpit and we don't see people who got up in the morning and got their family dressed and came to church to listen to us explain the Bible to them. Don't bring all that negativity and defeatist attitude into the pulpit with you. That's what they brought to church with them. Give them the word of God and pull them out of that. Give them the word of God and, and let them see the world might be a total disaster, but we're eating the fat and, and drinking the sweet and, and we're, God's wiping the tears from our eyes and this is great. Amen. They came to understand the scriptures and it changed their entire outlook on life. Now, preaching a sermon might do that, it might not do that, but the scriptures have the power to do that. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So look in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Isn't that a great passage there in Nehemiah? Yeah. 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Now we know that. And we, we say that all the time, and we, we, we hammer that, preach the word, preach the word. And Brother Dalton, they even, even mention it, preach the word. But the reason for preaching the word is in verse 1. It's not the congregation. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. My, my responsibility is not Please don't don't pick apart everything I, I, I say because it's, it's, it's easy to do. My responsibility is not to get people saved. I can't save anybody. It's not to enlighten save people. I can't enlighten the save people. My responsibility is to please the Lord Jesus Christ and preach the book he had written in a way that honors him, whether anybody responds to it or not. Brother, I, 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 I say this based on, on feedback. We have retired pastors in our church and, and other men, and, 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 and they, they will tell me on occasion, that was as good a salvation sermon as I've ever heard. And we'll have 15 lost people there, and the only move they make is to the restroom in the middle of the sermon. What did I do wrong? I didn't do anything wrong. I honored the Lord Jesus Christ by proclaiming what he did on the cross and what he did in resurrection. That's what I'm supposed to do. We have classes and midweek services and we go through doctrines and we, we teach doctrines. I had a lady come up to me uh, uh, not, not long ago. Uh, she'd been in our church 15 years. And she said, Preacher, you're going to laugh at me. Tonight was the first time I ever understood what you meant by the rapture. How many times have I preached on the rapture in the 15 years she's been there? Did I fail? Did I do it wrong? Did I not preach a good sermon? No, she just didn't get it. We're not preaching so they can get saved or they can get it. We're first and foremost, we're preaching because... The Lord Jesus Christ 
has done what he has done and is going to do what he is going to do and he deserves the honor of having that proclaimed in the ears of people. And if we could get off this, I'm preaching the word so something happens. And understand, I'm preaching the word because it deserves to be preached. Because Christ deserves to have these truths made known. It'll change everything. We get out street preaching. There's always Christians. You know, I say they're Christians. We get more grief from people who claim to be saved than lost people. We're out street preaching. I come and say, and let's see what good this does. I just put my hand on their shoulder. I say, you don't understand. The good has already been done. Hallelujah. We're proclaiming the good. Amen. We're not trying to do something good. Christ did something good. We're just telling these people about it. So preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, law, long suffering, and doctrine. Now, now this, a little different twist here for our purposes tonight. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Well, where are they getting these teachers? What if we're contributing to the appetite of people who don't want sound doctrine by losing the heart and the desire to minister sound doctrine because we want a better, a bigger hearing, a bigger following, better hearing, more people, better response. So we're going to give the people what they want. Well, in the context, we're supposed to give them what Christ wants them to have. They should turn away theirs from the truth, should be turned to the fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelism, make full proof of thy ministry. So the temptation, the temptation, whether it's in soul winning or bus ministry or expository preaching, what, what the case might be, our temptation is to view everything like an American. Is it successful? Is it profitable? Did it get the right amount of results? If it doesn't, let's retool and try something else. We're not doing this for, the, for results. We're doing it to honor the Lord. And if he wrote this book, and I haven't yet preached everything that's in this book, I need to get to the parts I haven't preached yet. I mean, honestly, he wrote it to be proclaimed. So, well, people are supposed to read it on their own, but they don't. <laughs> One of the great advantages that I have in the ministry, and I mean this, uh, I started three churches while working a full-time job and taking no salary at all. The church where I pastor now, I, we were nine and a half years in before I received any compensation. I, I carried, uh, delivered mail and, and, and worked secular job. And you know something? If you come from that background instead of go from Christian school to Bible school to being the man of God at 23, you don't have two hours in the morning to read your Bible. Bless well, God, if you guys run up in the morning going through your prayer list and reading your Bible and fasting and milking the cows, and <laughs> you know, you're out of touch with the real world, man. If those people spent two hours every morning reading their Bible, they wouldn't have the money to give that you're living on. <laughs> really, it's just a fact, man. We got a guy gets up at two in the morning to go to work. You think I give him grief about missing the Sunday evening service? No, I don't want to get up two in the morning and go to work and, and stock shelves. That's hard work, man. So, so we're, we're not supposed to be result-driven. I want to see people saved, don't you? I want to see saved people get baptized and not disappear. I don't know what your water's like up here. Our water makes people vanish. <laughs> we baptize them, they come up in the water, and they're like the Ethiopian eunuch. We never see them again. <laughs> Just... <laughs> he, he, he set kind of a pattern there for... <laughs> Philip, I thought you got a guy saved. I thought I did too, but I hadn't seen him since. So, so I, had a, um, I had a professor in, in college. I got saved halfway through my freshman year. And I want to tell you about Kenneth Walker. 
I, I was getting a degree in uh, journalism and in English, and who knew at the time that God, how, how much God was in that. You're talking about it, it's pretty, it helps a lot in studying a book the rest of your life. Anyway, I had a required course I had to take on Shakespearean plays. I don't like plays. I didn't like plays before I got saved. I shouldn't like reading plays, and I shouldn't like reading Shakespeare plays. Everybody walking in a little of puff pants, you know, and reciting lines. And Anyway, Kenneth Walker, I, I sat in that classroom, and Kenneth Walker was so into Shakespeare. I'd never seen a man as enthusiastic about anything in my life as that man was about Shakespeare. And he would get up and he'd do, a, he'd do a lecture one day on the occult in Shakespeare. And he'd say now in, in Hamlet Act 4, Scene 3, you have a ghost. And, and over here in Macbeth Act 2, Scene 5, you have another ghost. And this ghost and that ghost have a lot in common. And, and, and he, would, he would just do this whole thing about the occult in Shakespeare. And I thought, this guy knows, he knows act, he knows play, he knows line, he ties it all together. And I'd only been saved about a year, I guess, when I was taking that class. And I was sitting in that course, and, it, and I, I, it just occurred to me, I'm learning Shakespeare, and I don't even like it. <laughs> I'm, I'm becoming interested in something I have no interest in. And I made A's on those exams because that man imparted the answers to the test questions into me by the way he taught a subject I wasn't interested in. And I got to the end of that course, and I, God hadn't called me to preach or anything as far as I knew, and I, I didn't know what the Lord had for me in my life. But I remember praying to the Lord and, and saying, God, if I could learn the Bible like that man learned Shakespeare, I could teach it to people who don't even want to learn it. <laughs> and you know, brother, uh, in, in fairness... Good, saved people that love the Lord come to our churches, and, and that's, really, that's really out there for them. If you meet their family members, instead of talking to your deacons about them, their family members think they're fanatics because they go to church every Sunday. You think, what's wrong with these people, man? They just come once a week and they hardly know anything about the Bible. Their family thinks they've flipped out. <laughs> really, I mean, stand out on the highway on Sunday morning. There aren't many people coming to church. And the people that are coming, <laughs> that's why you got to get in the Bible. You got to know the Bible. Your whole heart's got to be in it. The attention span of the modern American is about 30 seconds. It is. My generation grew up reading books and we had a little TV in the evening. This generation, they've been watching videos since they were in the crib. Mom's doing whatever she's doing and the kid's sitting there in the high chair with a tablet watching movies. And every five seconds that image changes. Every five, there's lights going off and there's whistles and there's bells and there's music and there's sound and, and it's constantly changing. And you're going to stand up there with your great sermon and talk to somebody for 40 minutes and think they're listening? They don't know how to listen. They're not trained to listen. They can't, they can't lock in on what you're saying. So what do you have to do? Turn to this verse. Oh, <laughs> Look at this word. What are you doing? You're changing the image. You're clicking the remote. You got to keep going back to the Bible, back to the Bible, back to the Bible. You could stand there and just tell them what you know and give them your outline and alliterate it, but they can't follow that. You got to keep locking them back in and keep drawing their attention back in. They're wondering if they left the stove on. They're wondering if they're going to still have their job on Monday. They're wondering if that guy that's coughing over there, if it's going to really reach as far as they are, and they're all going to get it. Look, they made a great effort to be here. That doesn't mean they're here. <laughs> okay? So, what was up here? Expository preaching helps you communicate 
through preaching to a generation of people who is not trained to be communicated with through preaching. Most of you went to public school, I, my, you know, my generation, we went to a public school and a teacher stood in front of us for six hours and told us things. And we wrote down what the teacher said and we went home, we committed to memory and came and we actually, you had to learn to read to go to the next grade. You had to learn to do addition, go to the next grade. <laughs> this generation hasn't been educated that way. They haven't had 12 years sitting in a classroom of listening to someone teach or, or exposit or lecture. So that's why the modern churches are going to the light shows and the, and the bands and the mood and all that because they know these people can't pay attention. You've got to do that with your preparation. You've got to do that with your speaking ability, with your knowledge of the word, with your, your constant pointing people back to the scripture. And that's your real challenge. Yes. People aren't, they're not deliberately bored. Right. They're just not, and I don't mean this in a bad way. Well, don't talk about going to the gym. I used to go to the gym five days a week. Say hi, hand them the mail, go out the door and go to the, go to the next business. And I, that's, that's about the, about the extent of that. And so I never had arm day, leg day, upper day, lower day, none of that. I do have some nice flip-flops, though. I was going to get under conviction about that until I saw he had, a, he had a pink tie on. And, Bless God. <laughs> no, so here, here's the point I was going to make. I can't run two miles because I haven't trained to run two miles. Yep. I can't lift 500 pounds because I haven't trained to lift 500 pounds. And people can't listen to your sermon because they haven't been trained to listen to your sermon. So it can't be mediocre. That's right. It can't be average. It can't be dumb. You can't just hope, open my mouth and I will fill it. <laughs> Doesn't work for the president. It won't work for you. <laughs> so let's go to uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And we're not going to preach this, but we're going to show you all that is available to you in what we're calling expository preaching and what we mean by expository preaching. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start verse 11. And my Bible is, is like your Bible and probably your Bible, every Bible I've ever seen and all the commentaries I've ever seen either says something about the lost son or the prodigal son. And there's your starting point. You ever mess up, people hold against you the rest of your life. How come it doesn't say the son that came home? How come it doesn't say the son that was found? People are rough, man. I mean, this guy's been home for 2,000 years. We still call him the prodigal son. <laughs> that's, that's bad business. All right, so look at verse 11. And he said, Jesus speaking, a certain man had two sons. Now, now there's, there's two leaping off points for you to do Bible study. How many people in the Bible are certain people? How many certain men are there? I mean, there's lots of men, but how many certain men? How many certain women? There, there's, there's times when the Holy Spirit zeroes in on one person. And I want, I, I want you to be certain you understand this man. Certainly, this is a situation worth considering. So how many certain men are in the Bible? Had two sons. There's a, there's a month-long series of messages right there. Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau. How, how many two sons have prominent places in the Bible? Now, we're not going to go there this morning, but I can preach this on Sunday morning and then do a month of Sunday nights on two sons in the Bible. A lot there. The younger of them said to his father, 
Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divideth unto them his living. You know what he just asked for? His inheritance. While his father's still alive. Explain inheritances. Show from the Old Testament how inheritance in a Jewish household worked. And when you've done that, when you've explained to people, now you're, now you're ready to show this boy just ripped his father's heart out and stomped on it with his feet. He said, you're dead to me. I'm going to get half of your stuff when you die. I want it now because I'm never going to see your face again. That's cruel. Now, if you establish that, how much more incredible is the reception this father gave the boy when he came home? He didn't just leave. He didn't just leave on bad terms. He left his daddy for dead but took the stuff. <laughs> Pretty rough, isn't it? Yes. And, and so he says, uh, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. How many, how many people in the Bible have said, give me? I don't know, but there, there's something else to study, something else to work on. Well, I can't think of anything to preach. If you do expository Bible study that leads into expository Bible preaching, you don't say, I don't have anything to preach. You say, I won't live long enough to preach all of this. Because it's just, it's just incredible how it just grows and grows and grows. So he said, uh, give me, portion of goods fall to me, he divided on them as living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. There are verses in Proverbs and other places about waste wasteful, wasting, waster, run them. You got it made now. You just type the word in on your, on your computer program. We used to have a, a con paperback concordance with eight point type. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd have to look at and look and run all those, all those verses. Uh, I, I miss those days. It was a blessing. But so, so wasted. What does it mean to waste? Don't, don't, don't assume people know that. We know what waste is. It's when you don't, well, just make certain. With riotous living. Bible talks about people that riot in the daytime. Rioting, we have so many words. And, and again, you explain this to, to your church. We have so many words in the Bible that, that our modern culture has narrowed them down. Sober in our culture means you didn't have too much alcohol. But in the Bible, it's anything that takes you out of your right mind. We, when we think of riot, we think of people throwing uh, rocks and chairs through windows and stealing, you know, work boots and shovels and, and, uh, and, and tools, things they need to earn a living. And, uh, <laughs> but riot in the Bible is, the Bible says, riot, not accused of riot and unruly. It's people that won't be governed. So this man left a father's governing care and went out to live any way he wanted to. Well, that's, that's a lot more applicable to our Sunday crowd than trying to preach about rioters in Chicago or Philadelphia. Because all of us resent the yoke. And this young man said, I'm going to live without anybody telling me what to do. I'm going to get as far away from all these rules and regulations as I can. Great opportunity to preach practical truth. All right, and when he had spent all. There's a lot there. He said, what's, I didn't see what's there. What's, what's the lot that's there? Look how long it took. It didn't even take a whole verse. <laughs> and everything he left home with is gone. It doesn't say in after decades. It doesn't say in when he, when he got to the old age. It's like he left home, he hit the road, and he's broke. Now what are we preaching about? Well, your dad's got a house. Your dad's got enough money to give you half of it and still have a house. Your dad 
obviously knows a lot more about life than you do. Maybe the rules, maybe the rules are worth putting up with to learn how to not go broke in half a verse. <laughs> right? Your dad's cruel. Your dad's mean. Your dad doesn't know what he's talking about. Your, your dad's a, a taskmaster. Okay, go rent an apartment with six guys. Yep. See how much fun that is. <laughs> People got no idea how expensive life is. They have no idea how, how nobody cares. They're not waiting to help you. You're going to go to a bar and tell them how mean your dad was. They all had a dad like that. <laughs> They're not waiting for you to come so they can buy you drinks and, 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 and put their arm around your shoulder. They're all just like you. So we got, we've got practical preaching that we don't have to just pull, pull a verse out of a hat. We're, we're teaching through a story in the Bible, but it lends itself to the things we need to address. It says... says... Um, uh, so he, he uh, spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. Well, how many famines are there in the Bible? What happened during times of famine? The first one, the first one, Abraham by faith left Ur of the Chaldees and went to the promised land. Would you have expected a famine to break out in the land of promise, living in obedience to God? There it is. And so how do men respond in times of famine? What, what are the reasons in the Bible for times of famine? So that, that's, that's a whole uh, series of midweek messages right there that uh, keep you going. And he began to be in want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So here's a son that tried to make a go of it without the father's instruction and the father's oversight and he ended up in want. Don't you want to stay under your father's instruction and your father's oversight and be one of those sheep that shall not want? Where would you rather be? By the still waters, in the green pastures, or out here in the, in the, in the, uh, the barren land of want? Amen. All right, and so, so what happens here? He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. But wait a minute, I thought you didn't want anybody telling you what to do. I thought you didn't want anybody running your life. Well, you know what, son? <laughs> young lady, young man, if you want to buy groceries, you're either going to rent, win the lottery or somebody's going to tell you what to do. Yeah. They're going to tell you what time to show up and what color polo shirt to wear and what temperature <laughs> to fry the fries <laughs> and how much salt to put on them. And you're either going to learn to say, here you go, or my pleasure, depending on where you get the job. But somebody's going to run your life. When Joy himself said to that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Question. What are they doing raising pigs? They can't eat them. And if you're not going to eat them, I don't really know what you're going to do with them. They're hard to ride and you can't pull a plow with them. It's just... So, so this guy has re, he's reduced to he's got no money, he's got no home, he's got no friends, and now he's taking employment from someone who is completely defiant of God and the Word of God. That's right. yeah, good. This guy's in a mess. And so, brother, before you take your family out of church because you don't like the rules and the standards and the preaching's too hard and it offends you and it bothers you, where will you be without it? If you don't like this company, what company will you end up in? And if you have the nerve to look at Facebook, which I don't, that's why I'm still in the ministry. <laughs> if you had told people when they walked out of church how far they'd fall in six months, they would have been so insulted. But it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long. So there he is. He's now he's a now he's an assistant pig farmer. Verse sixteen. He would fain. Well, there's an archaic word in the Bible. No, no. There's no archaic words in the Bible. An archaic word is a word that has fallen out of use. We use all of them. 
Now, the majority of people in your society may not know some of the words in the King James Bible. But if you ever buy a product and, and you open it up and it comes with a, a, a sheet this long telling you about how to use the product, if you read that, which no one does, <laughs> there'll be a dozen words in there you don't know. Every, every area of life has technical words. You go to the doctor and the doctor gives you a prescription and, you, and your wife said, what do you give you? I can't pronounce it. What's it mean? I don't know. What are you going to do? I'm going to take it. <laughs> so this argument that there's words in the Bible I don't know, there's words in everything you read you don't know. We go to a restaurant and I say, I say to my wife, what is this? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's a chicken soup. Why don't they just say it's a chicken soup? Because they can charge you $4 more if you, if you don't know, what the, if you don't know the, what the name means. Anyway, so he says, uh, He would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. Now, let's be fair. I'm talking to you like I would talk to our church. Let's be fair. If you don't know the word fain, if you've never used the word fain, can't you figure out what it means by reading the verse? Does it mean he was excited? <laughs> Does, come on. He wishes he had the food the pigs have. But his job is to feed it to the pigs. He's not allowed to eat it himself. So you can, you can figure it out from the context. And what am I doing? I'm not insulting them for not knowing the word. I'm encouraging them to think that the Bible's not as hard as I was told it is. That I don't have to know all the big tricky words. Wow, look, I, I really can figure it out for myself. So we're, we're sending them home with some fat and some sweet drink and some, some happiness. Yeah, you know, that, that word, uh, that's really... That's really not all that hard after all. So uh, he would fain to fill his belly with uh, husk the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. And so when I, when I preach this passage, uh, Brother Dalton talking about these preachers get off on preaching on sin and all that. What a great place to get off preaching on sin. This guy's jealous of pigs. He's jealous of pigs. Young lady, the most popular social media celebrities in our society are whores. Why would you be jealous of a pig like that? You guys idolize these ball players. Oh, Tom Brady, he's the greatest football player ever lived. You mean the guy that fathers children out of wedlock, that guy? You mean the guy divorces his wife because he wants to, to, she's getting a little long in the tooth and he wants a younger model? That guy? Why are you jealous of pigs? You want heroes? Preachers, missionaries, servants of God. Look up to somebody who's not wallowing in the mire. See, now that's, she said it's not in the text. No, it's not, but the text let me go there. I mean, you're pretty low down when you're envying hogs. He's looking, through, he's looking through the slats in that fence and saying, I wish I had the life those pigs have. And you've got people sitting home tonight looking through their screen and saying, I wish I had the life that they have. They're piggy people. <laughs> Leave them alone. But he's, he's, low, he's low down. No man gave unto him. Who do you have in your life that will help you when you're down? You better stay in church. Who will you have out there in the world that will help you when you've got nothing left? You better stay in church. Better stay in church. All right. When he came to himself, nobody else around. <laughs> he left dad. He left his brother. He's got no friends. The pigs ain't talking to him. <laughs> So after you're done teaching this passage, how many people in the Bible had a conversation with himself? I will tear down my barns and build greater. 
Who are you talking to? <laughs> God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. <laughs> Who's, you're not talking to God. He, the Bible says he prayed thus with himself. Right. Lord's not listening. <laughs> So how many times in the Bible does somebody have a conversation with themselves and come to a good conclusion? He said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? There's a multitude of truths there. What's the difference between a servant and a hired servant? There's some people who serve and they don't get paid. And there's some people who serve and they do get paid. This man says, I left a house where my dad was rich enough to have people to work for him. And he still had enough money to give to me to come out here and, and, and waste it like I did. So he, he comes, hired servants, and then, and then uh, served my fathers, have bread enough and to spare bread. You preach a year on bread. Really, I mean, it's pretty important in the Word of God. Yes. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and the children of Israel had bread coming. I heard a guy one night on the radio, <laughs> late night, late night, back when back when you get her preaching on the radio, and this guy was out of out of Jamaica, New York. Apostle, he's an apostle, and you really want to listen to apostle when you get a chance. And uh, <laughs> he he said. I know, I know people preach against manna, uh, mammon like it's an evil thing, but I'm telling you, God sent mammon on the children of Israel every morning and every night. <laughs> yeah, don't hang on to that. All right, so bread enough to spare, I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. No more would be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. What has he done? He's come to the end of himself. He's come to a place of realization. He's come to a place of repentance. He's humbled. He started out saying, give me. And now he's ready to say, make me. I don't want to come home and ask to be a son. I'll, I'll just come home and, and be a servant if he'll have me back. Now, what else do we have to preach here? That must have been a really, really good man. How could that boy have entertained any thought at all that if I go home, my father will take me back? After how I treated him, after what I did to him. But he knows in his heart of hearts, everybody else in the world has forsaken me. But if I could just get back to my father. There's your sermon for all the backsliders. There's your sermon for all the kids that grew up in church and get out in the world and now they're 40 and divorced or 40 and a single mom with three kids and they've wandered back into church and wondering, is there any hope for me for the rest of my life? You know in your heart of hearts if you just go back to your father. He knew it. He knew it. Somehow, some way, he knew the only hope I got is getting back to my father. Now, Here's, here's the sermon for all the people in the in-between. You raised your kids in church. You tr raised them up just like God told you to. They didn't believe. They went out there in that world. You know what this father did? He didn't join a gay pride parade because his son went homo. He didn't go NIV in modern church because his kids didn't like preaching. He stayed in the house and begged God to send his boy home. He didn't move into the pig pen with him. I'll tell you what's hurt our church more than, more than young people getting old enough to go out in the world and going out in the world. It's watching their family follow them. And there, there it is right there. You preach that. There's a lot in this passage besides just a story. All right, and so verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But, but, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. You suppose? I mean, you, you read into the text. Just say you are. Say, I'm going to read into the text here. I, I'm, I'm not saying this is so, but it looks to me like this man must have got up every morning. 
and looked down the road to see if his boy was coming home. And the last thing he did every night before the sun went down is look down the road and see if his boy was coming home. Sir, I'm sorry about your son. Sister, I'm sorry about your granddaughter. But let the first thing you do every morning, the last thing you do every night is beg God to send them home. A lot of preaching here. A lot of preaching here. And the father saw him, he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So you can talk about Christ's compassion, the father's compassion, God's willingness to forgive, throw his arms around, embrace. I'm going to tell you something, man. The boy's out of money. He's feeding pigs. He's walking home. That was one stinky man that father put his arms around. That was one filthy face that father put his lips on. And what were you when you came home? What were you when you came to Christ? All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Aren't you glad there's a Father in heaven that throws his arms around filthy people? Aren't you glad mercy and truth will put a big kiss on repentance and faith? Thank the Lord. The son said unto him, Father, now this is really great, watch this. Father, I have sinned against heaven. That's point one from verse 18. And in thy sight, that's point two from verse 18. And I'm no more to be called thy son. That's point number three from verse 19. What's the next thing he was going to say? And make me as one of the hired servants. Verse 22, but the father, look, the father, when he says, I've sinned against heaven, the father, you're right, I'll take that. I've sinned in your sight. You're right, I'll take that. I'm no more to be called thy son. You're right, I'll take that. But I will not let you say, I'm going to be your servant. Because when you come home to me, I'm not going to punish you for what you did while you're gone. I'm going to restore you to where you were before you left. Sinner, sinner, listen, if you're here today and you're unsaved, church member, listen, you're here today and, and you're so far gone, nobody knows how far gone you are, but you know. What's keeping you from coming back to God is you're afraid of what he'll do if you come. I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll agree with you or you're a sinner. He'll agree with you you've sinned against him. He'll agree with you or you're not worthy. But he's not going to make you a slave. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even them believe on his name. Nobody deserves that. You know what this boy illustrates? God giving you what you don't deserve. In fact, look at it, verse 22. The father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. Well, there's, there's opportunity to preach about clothing. Starts in the garden. God brought some clothing to the man and his wife better than what they were wearing. Right? High priest, better clothing than what he'd wear to the park or to the beach or to yeah. Disney World if he goes with Brother Robertson down there. <laughs> A lot in the Bible about, about clothing. Yes. You read Psalm 45, it looks like the Lord's going to dress us up at that marriage of the Lamb. Praise the Lord. All right, so bring forth the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. When he left home, he took with him everything he was entitled to. While he was gone, he did nothing to earn anything from his father. Then what's this? It's all grace. It's all grace. You know something? When you came to Christ, 
He, the Father not only saved your soul, He gave you the Holy Spirit. He gave you everlasting life. He, I mean, you just start going down the list of things God gave you. You didn't earn salvation and you didn't earn the rest of the package either. But He's just so glad to have you back in the, in the family, so glad to have you in the house. He'll give everything He's got. Isn't that amazing? Now, I, I skipped over this uh, to, in, the, in the swine part. This is no longer an agrarian society. Most people in your church have never fed a pig. They've never fattened a calf. They think milk comes in jugs, <laughs> plastic ones. Okay, so you have an opportunity here to not, again, not be insulting, but say, look, a fatted calf. <laughs> this isn't one just running around in the field burning off weight. This isn't one we're just keeping so it gets old enough to make more babies. We have put this thing in a stall and we're giving it special food and special grain so to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger so we can have more people over to the barbecue. This calf had been prepared for the father's friends and family to enjoy. It was not being prepared for this boy. But when this boy came home repentant, he got in on it. Hey. Heaven wasn't made for me. I get in on it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Eternal life. <laughs> Jesus Christ is eternal life. I get in on that. So he gets, he gets all these blessings just, just for coming home. And then verse 24, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, you can go preach that uh, all, all around the clock. And they began to be merry. Celebrations in the Bible. Yes. That'd help in a time like this, wouldn't it? Yes. A series of times in the Bible when people celebrated. I preached a sermon one time on dancing in the Bible. You win a war. Your lost son comes and bless God, I'm against dancing. You wouldn't be. <laughs> if you've been through six years of Great Depression and five years of World War and peace was declared and the boys are coming home, you'd dance. Your son's been a drunk and a drug addict for 15 years and comes to church one Sunday morning, gets right with God, and Lord changes his life. You might do some things you never thought you'd do. <laughs> so it'd be fun to run, run um, uh, uh, being merry in, in the Bible. Look at 25. Now his elder son was in the field. As he came, drew an eye to the house, he heard music and dancing. So it's a Methodist home, not a Baptist home, but, but he... <laughs> He heard the music and the dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, the dog died. <laughs> we went bankrupt. I mean, you could guess dad's really happy about something. He wants the details. He said unto him, thy brother has come. Thy father killed the fatted calf because he perceived him safe and sound. There's a, there's a Bible phrase. People use it all the time. They don't know it's out of the Bible. How many of those are there? He's a good Samaritan. Cast the first stone. Just talk about all things people say, I don't know anything about the Bible. You know a lot of things about the Bible. You just didn't know they came out of the Bible. You go with that. He was angry, would not go in. How many people in the Bible are angry? What came of it? What was the result of it? Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Now here's a great sermon. Here's a great sermon. That boy out there in the world, the father's not going, going where he is. He's going to have to come to the father. But you're in the house and you're acting up. He's going to come get in your face. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 13, you're not his child. He's going to let you carry on. But you're his son. He's going to chase you. So the father gets in, he gets in this older boy's face. And he answering said, to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. You think so? 
Yet thou never gavest me a kid. I may make merry with my friends. Okay, so here's a good, here's a good Sunday night sermon because your Sunday morning people, they're not ready for this, but Sunday night people, they can take it. When you get bitter, you start lying. When you get bitter, you start exaggerating. Never, never, always. This, this teenager came in the office one time with her mom. She said, my mom's always yelling at me. I said, you're lying. I am not. She's always yelling at me. She, she never sleeps. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, then she's not always yelling at you. But you ever notice how those words, when somebody's, when their hearts got all twisted up, they start using these absolute words? Yes. That's what he's doing. And then I'll show you something, and you might have done the same thing. He says in uh, 30, as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. You ever put that in your sermon? Don't raise your hand. The younger son left and went into a far country, and he's just now come home. This older boy has no idea what he did while he was gone. The Bible record didn't say anything about harlots. You watch people that are accusing other people in your church, accusing other people in the family of God. They, they got a bitter spirit, got a bad heart. Better watch out for that. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. Shouldn't you be happy to be saved, be in the Father's house, have all your needs provided? What are you griping about? What are you complaining about? Somebody had a bigger party than you did. Somebody had more presents at their baby shower than you did. The preacher recognized somebody's birthday and forgot yours. Are you not saved are you not washed in the blood? Did he not take you out of the pig pen and put you in the house, or, or to keep, you, keep you from the pig pen? You know, sometimes, here's another sermon. Sometimes, boy, I wish I had a good testimony like that guy. He killed three people and got saved in prison. I don't have a good testimony. The best testimony is I got saved at seven years old and I've been in church all my life and I never tasted alcohol and I never smoked a cigarette and I never kissed a girl until I was at the marriage altar. That's a great testimony. Amen. How come you did all that for the prodigal son? Well, because he came home. Hallelujah. But I've been doing this for you every day of your life. Praise the Lord. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. All right, one last thing this evening. I, I know we're running. I guess we're running late. I don't know what time we're supposed to stop. I had some idea, but Brother Dalton threw that out the window. <laughs> I blame it on him. It's great to preach about this lost sheep in Luke 15, about people getting saved, and the lost coin in Luke 15 about people getting saved, and the prodigal son about people getting saved. But it's, that's all out of context. Look at verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. He spake this parable unto them, saying. This parable is not about the son that left. It's about the bad attitude of the people that have been in the father's house all along. And so how do we close this message out or this series of messages out? Judgment must begin at the house of God. Rejoice when people get saved. Be excited when people come to church that aren't up to speed. You're not going to lose your church over two new people getting saved or two new families coming that don't know what they're doing. But watch out for those people that instead of rejoicing that somebody got saved, want to tell you about what that woman wore last week and about what those kids were watching. They got, my kids heard they were watching this movie last week. And, yeah, okay, okay. Father done anything for you? You rejoice that you weren't out there where they were? 
Thank God you had a better upbringing than they did. Be careful. Be careful. But, but, so, what we've done this evening, I'm going to preach a sermon this evening. I just, I just want you to see how, how easy it is to preach through a passage of the Bible. How it takes all this burden and pressure off of you of trying to come up with something to preach. This one passage has given you three months of things to preach. But you've got to study it. You've got to search it out. You can't just skip across the surface. Then you're, then you're used up in one sermon. But if you dig in and study and you say, we're not, but don't mention, we're not against topical preaching. There's 30 topics right there. But you're preaching them within the framework and the context of expository preaching. You're not doing standalone things that may or may not be true as they stand alone. Okay, so we'll, we'll do uh, some more of this uh, tomorrow, Lord willing. Hope you can come back and be with us. Um, if we're not all trapped in our homes in the blizzard. <laughs> March, really? You want to have this in March? <laughs> 84 and sunny yesterday at Bible Baptist Deland. I'm, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of global warming myself. <laughs> I hope it just keeps getting up. Anyway, come ahead, brother.